Thank you, Tim, and, and thank you, uh, everyone here. I appreciate the uh, invitation to come out. I've been looking forward to uh, today, particularly given the uh, the week that I've had. I spent the last uh, two days taking uh, 400 elementary school kids on a uh, uh, field trip um, doing stream exploration. We were talking about stream ecology. So it's going to be nice to be up in front of a group for 20 minutes or so where everybody can actually sit still. <laughs> Um, if I'm speaking too loudly, I, I may have uh, had some hearing loss while I was taking uh, 100 kids at a time out into the uh, chilly waters of Big Walnut Creek in the Columbus area, so I apologize. My uh, objective here today, if I, if I understood the invitation, was to provide a kind of a general overview of um, aeration and um, lake aeration, what it's all about, what the benefits are. And um, I'm here as a scientific consultant. Um, I'm not um, promoting any particular technologies, but giving you kind of a, a general overview of aeration and its uh, effect and function in, in natural waters. So um, I'm going to kind of lay the all right, great, thank you. Kind of lay the groundwork um, for uh, for what this is all about. So basically, water aeration is uh, the presence of oxygen in, in water. And uh, this happens, this is something that happens naturally. Uh, and it's a, it's a chemical parameter uh, within natural waterways that, that fluctuates um, considerably on a daily basis and on a seasonal basis. The, um, the graph here shows uh, an example of uh, the dissolved oxygen cycle uh, during, the, during the day. This is what we refer to as a diurnal cycle. And um, the dashed line um, that you can see that's uh, labeled as nutritionally balanced. Okay. Um, this, this line uh, represents the daily fluctuations um, in a nutritionally balanced lake where things are, are generally balanced out and you're not heavy with, uh, with phosphorus. And what's uh, happening there is that during the day when the sun's shining and the light is penetrating the water, photosynthetic um, organisms, algae um, and plants are actually producing oxygen and that oxygen diffuses into the water naturally and increases the oxygen levels during the day. At night, uh, those same plants actually respire like we do, so they're, they're taking oxygen out of the water. And decomposition processes in the water are also functioning to um, take oxygen out of the water, and this uh, system just sort of cycles up and down, up and down every, every uh, day and night. Uh, but gently, so as you can see from that, uh, that dash line. The solid line represents what happens in a eutrophic lake where the uh, nutrification, uh, the nutrient levels are extremely um, high and you get much more wild swings in the dissolved oxygen levels. Um, and it's higher, basically higher peaks and valleys as a result. On a seasonal basis, this next graph kind of shows what's happening throughout the year, and this is this is actually from a uh, study on the um, Passaic River in New Jersey, but um, it illustrates the point. This is a fairly slow-moving stream, and lakes function in a similar manner on a seasonal basis, where you will see uh, the black line is your dissolved oxygen levels, and the blue line is temperature. So as temperature climbs in the uh, spring and summer, dissolved water can actually hold less oxygen. So the dissolved oxygen uh, starts to decline. And so you'll see those uh, two lines basically crossing where dissolved oxygen is dropping as temperature is increasing. Then in the fall, that situation reverses. Temperatures are starting to cool down. The water can hold more oxygen. And the uh, oxygen levels start to pick up again. So you need to kind of keep this dynamic in mind when you're thinking about um, aeration and, and its benefits. So in a uh, typical lake, and I'll um, 
let you know that uh, you're probably already aware that we don't have a typical lake at Grand Lake St. Mary's, um, primarily due to its, its uh, surface area versus depth. Uh, it's, it's relatively shallow. And um, so we have a little different dynamic in, in Grand Lake. But in a more typical lake, in the winter, you'll get a stratification where you've got uh, colder temperatures at the surface and warmer temperatures under the ice. In the spring, when the surface waters start to warm, you'll get a what's called a turnover. As those um, surface waters approach the temperature of the bottom waters, things can mix more thoroughly. And um, then in the uh, summer, which is the lower right, you'll start to get uh, a situation where there's warmer water on the surface and a transitional zone that's referred to as the thermocline with cooler waters beneath. That situation will typically persist during the summer months. And then in the fall, um, as the temperatures at the surface start to cool, you get another turnover where the, the temperatures start to equal out. The cooler bottom temperatures are matched by the cooling surface temperatures, and things can turn over again. Now, if the um, bottom waters uh, are loaded with a lot of built up organic matter that's breaking down the bacteria that are um, that are breaking down the the organic matter actually use up oxygen in that layer and um, so it may be uh, a fairly low oxygen um, portion of the lake and sometimes these turnovers then may actually cause fish kills because all of a sudden there's a sort of a flush of uh, mixed water with very low oxygen um, coming to the surface. So this is just kind of a cutaway view of the uh, uh, sort of summer condition for a, a typical lake with a little more depth to it, where you have an epilimnion, which is the warm, lighter surface water, that transitional zone referred to as the thermocline, and then the hypolimnion, which has more cool, uh, heavy water. Here at Grand Lake, the lake is so shallow, so th thoroughly mixed generally, that we don't really get that, that stratification effect. And that can have some, some consequences in terms of the uh, uh, mixing and, and movement of phosphorus within the system. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, real quickly, uh, a slide here on uh, the measurement of dissolved oxygen, there's a variety of different field probes that one can use to test uh, dissolved oxygen levels. Um, some field kits, uh, little chemical kits that are uh, based on uh, color change. You can see here there's um, someone using a, a dissolved oxygen kit where you mix some reagents and it'll give you a, a color readout that you can match up to a diagram. And then there's some more sophisticated meters that can be used to get direct readings. So we've been using some of these tools to um, test water around some of the demonstration projects out at the lake, particularly the, uh, the data sign that you see, the big, the big probe, which is a multimeter, can get a bunch of different readings, including dissolved oxygen. So I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of aeration. And I, I'm talking about aeration in all of its forms, just having oxygen in the water. It's important for uh, respiration. Uh, living things in the water require a certain level of oxygen, as you're all aware. Uh, fish, insects, uh, anything that uh, survives in the water requires a certain amount of oxygen. And uh, five parts per million dissolved oxygen uh, is, is sort of a general threshold for fish um, survival. There are some tough customers like the carp that were just mentioned earlier that can withstand very low dissolved oxygen levels of one or two ppm. Um, but I don't think anybody wants to uh, have a fish population that's entirely dominated by those very um, rugged, uh, tough uh, fish. Um, so the, the other process that I had briefly touched on, and I want to mention again here, related to uh, influences on dissolved oxygen is decomposition. As uh, the algae, plants, uh, aquatic life um, grow, 
um, senesce and, and die and decay, um, the microbial community that is responsible for the decomposition process uh, actually will um, use up oxygen in the water. So having more oxygen naturally present actually helps to facilitate aerobic decomposition, which is a, a, a faster process than anaerobic decomposition, and um, it can uh, uh, help to uh, sort of combat the, the ill effects of uh, um, low oxygen levels and can actually reduce the buildup of sediment. If you have a healthy um, level of oxygen in the water, you're going to have a more balanced situation and less accumulation of, of uh, organic debris. The dissolved oxygen levels actually have an influence on nutrient solubility. They, um, the dissolved oxygen can affect these um, nutrients in the water column and sediment layer. There's still, um, I guess the jury's still out, but um, I've read a number of papers that indicate that if you're in a situation where you're able to maintain an aerobic layer on the surface of the sediment, it actually helps the sediment um, hold more uh, phosphorus. It, it, it makes the phosphorus less um, bioavailable for resuspension into the water column. So every, every night when the uh, dissolved, oxygen, dissolved oxygen levels sag in the lake, that may um, help to promote more phosphorus to uh, be reintroduced to the water column. And if, um, if you have that imbalance, you're going to see situations like this, where this, this upper lake um, in the picture is choked with algae and it's, it's very imbalanced as it flows into this larger lake that hasn't been so dramatically impacted by phosphorus you can see the difference in, in clarity there so that's um, just a visual indication of, of how that uh, balance of oxygen and nutrients can play out So another benefit of aeration, in this case the uh, image is, is one of um, a fountain, um, that type of circulation can uh, affect the um, algae that's present by um, affecting its buoyancy. And you probably notice this around your residences that on particularly windy days when the water's choppy you're seeing less algal mats, algal scum. Um, around your properties and then when you get a, a calm day all of a sudden it's, it's building up. That's an influence of, of the lack of uh, uh, circulation and aeration. So basically uh, nature is really our, our best aerator. Uh, these things happen in the world around us uh, naturally. There's um, photosynthetic aeration. I mentioned this um, earlier when we were talking about the diurnal cycles. Plants um, photosynthesize and produce oxygen when the, when the sun is shining, and that oxygen then diffuses into the water. It can be this can be um, true uh, higher aquatic plants or or algae. Both are producing oxygen in the water. At night, um, when there is no sunshine, plants actually respire, um, so they're producing CO2. But in the, in the balance, um, plants tend to produce more oxygen than they take out. So that's photosynthetic aeration. We also have atmospheric aeration. Basically, the wind is blowing across the surface of the water. That enables the um, oxygen to diffuse into uh, the water. Any kind of agitation enhances that, the wind wave effect and um, you'll reach an um, equilibrium between the uh, surface air, the atmosphere, and the water. And I mentioned aeration through turnover. Um, that can happen on a, on a seasonal basis. Uh, depending on the conditions in the bottom waters, that may be a good thing or bad thing in terms of um, overall aeration. If you've got a lot of organic matter that's built up and those um, microbial communities are using all the oxygen in the bottom water, the turnover can actually lower your 
dissolved oxygen, but in other cases that cool water may actually have a higher oxygen content than the overlying uh, layers. But again, that's um, not at work quite as much in Grand Lake due to its uh, overall shallowness. So we wanted to look at um, some specific forms of aeration and just generally talk about um, these forms of aeration. Artificial circulation, what it can do um, to sort of stabilize um, the situation within the lake. And again, I'm not, um, not here to promote any particular technology today. I just want to generally describe how um, supplementing the uh, aeration in the lake uh, can produce positive results. Uh, basically, artificial circulation um, can increase um, the oxygenation in the water by forcing water uh, to the surface. And this is an example here of a bubbler system where the bubbles are rising to the surface. They kind of create a convection type flow. And the, the bubbles themselves help to um, transfer some oxygen to the water. And um, the, the smaller um, those bubbles can be, the more likely they are to really affect um, oxygenation. But the kind of convection current that forms around those bubblers is also beneficial to uh, move water from uh, the lower depths up to the surface where it can um, pick up atmospheric oxygen and, and then uh, circulate on through. Uh, so that's an important process. In general, if you're interested in, in looking at aeration technologies, it's best to um, get those in place before the algae blooms really start. Um, you'll get a better, better result. Um, you're basically helping the system kind of stay on top of the, the situation. And this, again, is not a, a major issue for Grand Lake, but uh, sometimes the mixing can be a bad thing if you have a, a lake um, that uh, has colder temperatures and it sustains cool water, cold water fish species like uh, rainbow trout, for instance. Um, mixing that water might actually increase the temperatures at the bottom, which could be detrimental to the fish, but we do not have that issue here. We've got plenty of warm water. <laughs> if, you've got, um, if you do have a cold water situation, um, there, there are specific types of what are called hypolimnetic aerators that um, take water from the, the cold uh, bottom waters um, up to the surface in a way that uh, it can, it can uh, reduce mixing um, through the thermocline and, and uh, maintain cooler temps at the, at the bottom. And I, I wanted to mention, I, I think that a lot of the, the aeration options um, on the lake are, um, we're still kind of developing a sense of what what works best, and I think that um, scaling issues kind of come into play. There are going to be certain um, settings around the lake that really benefit from certain forms of aer aeration, um, other areas that uh, benefit from, from other forms. Um, the irrigator is something that's been utilized out here with some uh, positive results to um, increase the infusion of, of atmospheric oxygen transfer and, and uh, it creates some uh, water movement, which can aid um, the circulation and, and oxygen transfer. This is a technology that's really more appropriate for large open bays. Um, doesn't do nothing that we've seen so far. Does particularly well in the open lake because the the windswept conditions on the open lake are really the the uh, everybody's best friend in terms of uh, getting oxygen into the water. Um, but when you get into um, large embayments. Uh, a, a more expensive technology like this might be the way to go to move large volumes of water over time. In smaller basins, uh, surface spray type applications, fountains um, can uh, help to uh, add atmospheric oxygen into the water. Uh, you're just basically creating water droplets that are moving up into the air and, and becoming better oxygenated and you get that um, uh, turbulence that helps to knock down the buoyancy of the algae and benefit the situations there. And then with the um, 
uh, bubbler type systems, we think that those have some, some very um, valuable applications in the, in the canals and things closer to homes where you're, you're not having to move as much water, uh, but you want something consistently um, circulating water, um, creating that, that circulation and adding oxygen to the water. Uh, the, the, the one thought that uh, uh, came into my head uh, when kind of looking at these different uh, technologies is that basically um, the, the main benefit is that you're supplementing oxygen uh, all the time. And when your um, bubblers are running on a really um, windy day when maybe there's good water exchange through your canal, the bubblers themselves may not be um, creating a huge difference in dissolved oxygen from what we've been seeing, but it's those windows that you hit on a nightly basis or a weekly basis where things are very calm, um, the uh, photosynthesis is shutting down because of nightfall. Um, at those times, you can enhance the aeration within the canals to keep the aerobic uh, decomposition moving forward that cuts down on sediment problems. Um, it continues to disrupt the buoyancy of algae. And um, with that, that continued uh, push, um, it can help to reduce those eutrophication issues within those uh, canal systems. So that's um, a basic overview. Uh, do you have any questions on aeration, natural or supplemented? As far as the uh, plant life, yeah, and uh, just if you had uh, any thoughts about uh, reestablishment of uh, plant life in the uh, lake itself, if you look at that, or if you had any experience with uh, reintroducing uh, plant species. To yeah, um, Milt Miller actually asked us to uh, start to take a look at that particular issue. I had uh, staff members um, go around to some of the areas where the um, aquatic um, vegetation, like aquatic bed vegetation, uh, wetland plants were still um, surviving um, to try to start to get a sense of why those have persisted when in other areas they've all but disappeared. In general, um, more abundant and thick shoreline vegetation is a good thing in terms of, of uh, maintaining oxygen levels. It's good in terms of creating fish habitat, uh, protecting shorelines, uh, but there are challenges to um, getting vegetation reestablished because we have a lot of you know, really choppy uh, shorelines. It's hard to get um, uh, a stand of plants established because oftentimes they're just getting rolled in the, in the surf, essentially. Um, and then we have the carp problem. So it's going to take a little bit of innovation to figure out how you can um, sort of uh, create these protected shallows um, and get vegetation established. We really, you know, we're going to all benefit from getting more carp out of the lake. Um, the rough fish removal, I think, is huge. Um, and then it's going to take a little bit of uh, elbow grease and, and manpower to get uh, plants uh, reestablished and a little bit of ingenuity to protect them while they establish. The nice thing is, once you get a healthy um, width of, of shoreline vegetation established, it's going to naturally perpetuate itself and protect the shoreline from wave action and, and things could improve drastically from there. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of things that need to be uh, dealt with maybe before we can even do much successful reintroduction right uh, in, the, in the water. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. What is the oxygen level of this lake at its best and at its worst? We were um, seeing uh, levels uh, last summer when we were doing some, some monitoring around some of the demonstration projects um, that were maybe uh, 12, 15 parts per million. Um, it improves in the fall, as I said, because the water can naturally hold more oxygen. Um, but when the sun was shining, the algae produces a lot of oxygen and the numbers go pretty high. Um, overnight, 
um, those numbers drop. And so in the early morning, you know, we were oftentimes just seeing you know, five or six parts per million. And if you drop the probe down to near the sediment interface, we might be seeing you know, two or three parts per million. And um, that, that real low oxygen um, condition is probably more prevalent over, overnight as, as the um, bulk of that organic matter that lays on the bottom of the lake is, is decomposing and the microbes are stripping the oxygen out. You may see even lower dissolved oxygen levels throughout the water column until the next morning when the sun comes up and the algae start producing more oxygen. Over here on the west bank. There's a big, big uh, bay over here that has uh, a big area of, of water lilies. Yes. How much benefit? How much benefit do they get if water get out of that? Well, I, I imagine I, I'm a wetland guy, so I, I like to think plants are doing good work for us. Um, natural uh, vegetative areas like that can um, can really add um, a, a good protection factor to the lake and, and add oxygen and certainly providing good good habitat I don't have any hard numbers on that we haven't done any specific sampling in those areas but um, those were wonder they, get, they grow and they come back every year yeah yeah and that's a good thing I think they're in a kind of a protected area they've got a little bit of relief from the chop uh, which probably benefits the system and something that we can take some, you know, if we if we get to a point where we can actually sort of redesign, re-engineer some um, areas of shoreline vegetation, we're going to take our, our design cues from what's working naturally and we can go into those areas. That's what I was describing earlier with sending staff out to take some notes on water depths and, and uh, wave protection and what they were seeing in the areas where vegetation had maintained itself because we've lost it in a lot of a lot of areas of the lake. Anything else? I'll be around um, after the meeting if anybody wants to pull me aside and ask any specific questions. I thank you for your time today.